Hi, I'm Nagin. I'm 17 years old. I was raised in a Muslim household, and I'm just going to share with you about how the Lord found me and why I am a Christian today. Um, I was introduced to the gospel in my sophomore year of high school by a teacher, actually. My friend Mallory and I were in class, and she turns to him, and I guess she knew he was a Christian, but I had no idea. So she turns to him and asks him, hey, if I do drugs and go to parties and do whatever I want for my whole life, can I just get into heaven? And so my teacher, he goes on this whole spiel, and I'm listening to him speak, and I'm like, wow, I've never heard these things before. So then I go to basketball practice, and the weekend passes by, and I'm... Whatever he said, I, I really, to this day, I don't even remember what he said, but whatever he said was constantly on my mind. So I went to him the next week, and I was like, hey, whatever you said, I mean, it's really bugging me. It's on my mind. It's been on my mind for a while. So he, he turns to me and says, you know, me and my wife have been praying for you for a certain amount of time. And I was shocked, but I was also confused because I didn't understand why he was praying for me. I was like, I'm not sick. I'm totally fine, like, you don't need to pray for me, <laughs> but then, um, he tells me to go on BibleGateway.com, and so I'm like, what, what's Bible Gateway, so I go to BibleGateway.com, and he tells me to look up Romans 8, um, so I do, and I look up Romans 8, and I even typed it in wrong, <laughs> I look up Romans 8, and it's all about, you know, walking in the spirit, and avoiding your flesh, and if Christ chooses to dwell in you, he will dwell in you, um, and I was so confused. I was like, what is the flesh? What is walking in the spirit? What, I mean, how do you know if Christ chooses to dwell in you? Like, what? That's not fair, you know? Um, and so I just had all these questions, and I was really confused. Um, but then I turned to him as if to say, okay, whatever. Like, why did you have me read this? Um, so then he asked me if I've ever read my Quran, and I... I look at him and I say, yeah, I mean, I, I've read it before, but I'm not supposed to read it because you're not supposed to read translations, and I don't speak Arabic, I speak Farsi, um, and so you're just not supposed to read it in another language other than Arabic. So he goes, well, why don't you just try reading it again so you know what it, what it actually says? And I'm like, why not? Why not sit down and, you know, read what I, what I believe in, what I pray five times a day for? Um, so I go back home and I bust out my Quran and I start reading it. And by this time I was a little bit older um, than the other times I was reading it. So I definitely got um, a different feel for it. And I, I definitely started reading it with, you know, just with, under, with understanding. And I just understood what I was reading. And so as I was reading, I started noticing verses that I've never noticed before. I started noticing verses about, you know, how men can beat their wives, and I started noticing other verses about just the violence and how I can't have Christians or Jewish friends, and I started noticing all these things, and I was wondering, like, is there an explanation for these verses? So I go to the Hadiths, and I look at, I look at the Sunnah, I look at what I believe in, and it just, it supports the claims that are in the Quran, so... Uh, I just had all these questions running through my mind as to why I've never noticed these before and why the, why the Ummah never told me about this before. And so I go back to him weeks later and I'm like, hey, can I have a Bible? I don't want to be a Christian. I just want to see what you believe in. But to be honest, my intention was not to, to seek out the Lord or to, to find truth. I really honestly just wanted to see what quote unquote Americans believed in. I'll find, I found out later that was kind of foolish to think of, but, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, so he gives me the Bible, and he's like, why don't you turn and read the Gospels, and I'm like, what is a Gospel? So he's like, why don't you read Matthew, and I'm like, where is Matthew, and he's like, it's in the New Testament, and I'm like, what? <laughs> so he pulls it out, and he turns to the New Testament, and I, and I see the Gospel of Matthew in front of me, and I'm like, why is there an Old Testament and a New Testament? Why are there two books in one book? That doesn't make any sense. Why are there two books in one book? And so I was really confused. I didn't understand um, about, you know, God's old covenant. Um, I just didn't know those things. I was never taught those things. As a Muslim, you're just not taught those things. Um, so I look at it, and I'm like, okay, I'll read it. But I just wanted to read it for fun, and I didn't want to read it to, to search out for truth or to look for God in any way. And so I went home that night and I read the whole Gospel of Matthew and I took a piece of paper out and wrote every question I had down. If something didn't make sense, I wrote it down. And 
just about everything didn't make sense, so I wrote it down. I mean, I, I was like, who's this guy? What does apostle mean? What is a disciple? You know, like, why is baptism important? You know, why did Jesus get baptized? And so I would write all my questions down. And I was in journalism at the time, so I was definitely trained to ask questions. Um, so I come back the next day with, like, a paper filled with questions, and I'm like, hey, can you answer these for me? So... He's like, wow. So he was totally overwhelmed, and then he's like, why don't you email my wife, and she can answer some questions for you. And so I took the email, and I didn't email her at first, but then I, I started emailing her once I started noticing that none of my questions could be answered in the amount of time that I had at school. So I started emailing his wife, and she was really good about explaining to me the history of certain books and the history of the churches that Paul was writing to, and it just started making much more sense when I started um, learning about these things. and. She was even telling me like the history of the prophets' lives and stuff, and I asked questions. So I was reading like a book a night from the Bible until at one point, it was months later, um, I sat down in front of my dining room table and I asked myself what I was doing. What what was I doing? I mean, I'm a I'm a Muslim, like Muslims don't even believe in the Bible. Like we believe that it is corrupted, and so how could I read such a corrupt book? And I finally realized what I was reading. I mean, I had no idea like what I would find um, in the New Testament. But I found that God had sent his son down and died for the sins of his own people, that he was raised to life, which in turn conquers death so that we can be redeemed, so that we can be reconciled by God, with God. And so I was just, I finally understood what I was reading, and I understood what, what the intention of these books were like there was a point why Paul wrote those letters there's a there's a point to those things and so I sat down in disgust I was very angry um, because I have read such a blasphemous book for so long I mean how can how can God become a man how can he come in flesh he's not his creation you know so I was thinking about all these things and I was just like wow you know no wonder like no wonder I was never supposed to read this book. No wonder the Muslims tell me it's corrupted. Of course it's corrupted. How blasphemous is this, you know? And so I just sat there and discussed, and I realized that I had two options. I could either, one, at that point, give the Bible back um, and not deal with Christianity again and hold on to my Islamic beliefs, or I could either, two, continue to read the Bible, but I would definitely look at it differently. If Because now I knew what it was saying. I knew that it was saying... Um, the message of salvation, like that it was claiming the message of salvation. And so I chose the second choice and I said, I'm going to keep reading, but I'm not going to believe in this. I don't have to believe that, you know, God came down in the flesh. I don't have to believe that. All I have to do is acknowledge that this book is saying that. And that was a huge milestone for me because once I acknowledged that, everything looked different. Um, I looked at the Bible differently. I looked at it as it could be something that lives, something that is active, and something that claims to be the truth of the world. So it definitely, it definitely changed my perception. And then I realized that something else needed to be changed. I needed to view the world as it, was, as it were God's. I needed to view people as if God had created them. And so I started changing my perception of people. I was like, okay, no, they're really, you know, I really need to start paying more heed to the fact that this is God's creation. And once I did that, I started noticing things that I had never noticed before. Um, and I started noticing just how bugged certain things bugged me, like just how bad certain things bugged me. And so I would start noticing like just the sinful nature of human beings and my own sinful nature. And I would ask, you know, why, why did that just happen, or why did this just happen? There was one day when I was sitting in my history class and we were watching a video of Hiroshima bombing, and my classmate from across the room starts laughing at the guy who's on the video, and the guy who's on the video, um, just his whole back was just skinned, and he just had no more skin left on his back, and she starts laughing at that, and I look at her and I'm like, I cannot believe she's laughing at this. So I, I look at her and I, I talk to her and I'm like, dude, what's your problem, you know? Um, how can you laugh at another man so great distress? I mean, he has a wife, he has children. Like, how can you laugh at that? Um, and I realized that it, there was only one answer to it. How can, how can a human being laugh at another human being so great distress? The answer lied in the Bible. It was her flesh that was making her... Um, so narcissistic, so selfish, so unable to care for someone else's life and being and comfort. Um, 
And it was that day when I realized that one of the questions that I've been asking my entire life, why are human beings so messed up? It, it lied in the Bible. The answer to that question lied in the Bible. Because I had been reading the Bible by this point, I, I knew what it was saying. Um, so that was definitely also a turning point as well. But then I started looking more in depth into Islam. Like, I can't just, you know, I can't just follow this faith for no reason, like if I don't know enough about my own faith. So I, I bust out and I take like six Quran translations and I put them all in front of me and I'm like, all of these translations can't be wrong, you know, they all have to coincide and if they all coincide then that means that it is saying what it is saying, it's not corrupt, you know, as the Ummah will tell you that it is. And so I was looking at all these translations and I was reading them over and they were all saying the same things. And so I started going to sheikhs and imams and other scholars and I started asking them questions. I mean, I went to MSA after MSA. I went to all these Muslim student associations. I did everything I could and talked to the people that I needed to talk to. I talked to people, I talked to Muslim scholars who had studied Christianity. I talked to Muslim scholars who had converted from Christianity. I didn't leave, like, I didn't just become a Christian without paying heed to Islam, like, I loved Islam. To this day, like, I have just this attraction to Islam that I cannot explain. Um, and so I decided I need to learn more about my own faith. So when I would ask them questions, like, why does it say this, or did Muhammad really do this, or is the Prophet really who you say he is, why did he do this in this battle? And so I would ask these questions, and they would answer me and some of them would say, yeah, I mean, you're right, you know, and so they would just acknowledge this, this what I had found and it was, it was just crazy to me that they would acknowledge it. And some of them would say, you know, I think you have a psychological problem for asking these questions. <laughs> and so I'd be like, okay, dude. <laughs> and so, um, so I started asking Christians as well. I started going to, you know, different Christians that I knew. And I, my resources were so limited at the time because I couldn't drive. But, I mean, I just read every John Piper book on the internet. You know, I watched a billion debates. I can't even, like, sit down and go through all the debates that I've seen. And then um, I just called different churches. If someone gave me a flyer to a church, I went on the church and I called them and said, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about Christianity. Can you come and explain some things to me? Or I would, um, or I would, you know, go online and read certain books. I read lots of Lee Strobel's books. I'm sure a lot of you guys have. I read lots of those books. But there's a point where I was like, wow, you know, if there there really is a God in this world, then it can't just lie between Islam and Christianity. Like he could be in any of the world's greatest religions. So then I was like, okay, I need to break down like every religion out there to see you know, who, who God is. And so I go out and I swear this is all the Holy Spirit because I don't just read a whole bunch of books for fun. That's not me. But I mean, I was just going through book after book and I was just going through like just resources. And if I had a question on things, like if I had a question on hell, I wouldn't just ask a random person, say, hey, do you, do you know why God sends these people to hell? I would contact a professor at a Christian school who taught on hell and who wrote about hell, um, who wrote about hell in books and stuff. I would contact him and talk to him and email him and call him and say, can you answer this question for me? So I went to the right people who, like if I had a question on the resurrection of Jesus, I would go to a scholar who had studied on the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I would make sure that my resources were the right resources that could answer my questions. Um, that is very like vital, and if you're going to go on a search for God, you do need to take heed to that. Um, and so then I started breaking down like every religion. I went like to atheists, and I spoke to atheists, and every belief system, and I went to like a Buddhist temple, and I was just like, and ultimately all of that searching and all of that reading on different religions led me back in, in the same position. I was holding my Quran and I was looking at my Bible in the same confused look that I did in the beginning. Um, and so I had the same questions in my head and I was like, okay, I mean, it lies between these two. It, it just does. And it's not because Islam had somehow, you know, seemed better than the other belief system or seemed more consistent than Buddhism or say Hinduism. I mean, at a logical standpoint, or historical standpoint, Islam isn't as consistent as I would like it to be. But it was still there because I have, I have an attachment to it. My whole family is Muslim. All, 
all my, you know, distant relatives are Muslim, the country that I come from, like, that is a 99.9% .9 Muslim country. Um, that is why my Quran was still there, and that is why I still was confused about the Bible, because it wasn't, by this point, it wasn't a matter of questions, or, or it wasn't a matter of, is the Bible really true, is the Bible really consistent, is the resurrection of Jesus really reliable, is Jesus who he said he was, were these scholars just making things up, is Paul who Paul was in the Bible in the New Testament, um, and it wasn't questions on hell or, or anything anymore, it was just... I was sitting there and I was like, I, I can't believe in this. I mean, I just, I can't do this because I was not born into a Christian family. I was meant to be a Muslim. I was born into a Muslim family. I was meant to follow Allah. I love Allah. I love Salat. Like, I loved everything about Islam. It was just so, I mean, it gave me a balance between being an Afghani and being an American. Being Muslim was my balance. I loved Islam. There were, I mean, even to this day, I have such an attraction to it, and I have to remind myself that it is false and not true. Um, and so I was, so I was looking at my Bible, and I was just, by this point, I was like, I can't believe in you. Like, you know, God, sorry, like, I can't do this because I was just, my parents are going to kill me. Like, my parents, what are they going to do? Like, I'm going to get beat for it. I'm going to get persecuted. I'm never going to get to marry a Muslim guy. And all these thoughts went through my head. Um, and so Ramadan came around, and I was just like, I'm going to put the Bible aside. Like, I'm just going to devote myself to Allah this month. I'm just going to do what I need to do. Like, it was kind of almost like a last-ditch attempt because I so desperately wanted to be Muslim. I so desperately wanted to believe in something that was a lie because it gave me everything that I was fed up for in life, everything that my parents wanted. It would make my, you know, parents happy. It would make my brothers happy. And so... I just tried to I just tried to devote myself to Allah. I prayed way more than five times a day. You know, I did every Fajr Salat and every Sunnah Salat. Like, I did every like, you know, I did every like Fajr Asr Maghrib Aisha. I did you know the Fard ones and the Sunnah ones. I did everything that I can so that I could have a relationship with Allah. You know, I was learning how to recite the Quran in Arabic. I was reading like Surah An Nas and all these different things. And I was going to Muslim, you know, Muslim parties. And I was going to Muslim classes. I would go in belief in Allah classes every Sunday night. I did everything that I could. I just, I surrounded myself by the Muslim Ummah. And I just, I even prayed at school. Like I would go and do Udu in the girls' bathroom. And girls would be like, what are you doing, you know? And I'd be like, um, this is just kind of what you do when you're Muslim. And so I would explain to them these things. And I would even pray Salat. Like when the class, when my teacher was teaching, I would go in the back room and I would pray Salat. So I did, man, I just tried so hard, you know, to learn as much as I could about Islam. And I just, I tried so hard to make it fit into my mindset and to, to just say, no, this is, this is the truth. But Eid al-Fitr came around, so it's, everyone knows it's like the biggest Muslim holiday. It's one of the biggest. Um, and we were celebrating the end of Ramadan, and we were at my aunt's house, and everyone was just praising me, like, oh, Nagin, you did so well, we're so proud of you. We're so excited that, you know, you did so well, and you're praying all these things. We're so excited you're becoming just this great Muslim, this great Muslim woman. Um, and I looked at them, and I'm like, oh, thank you, you know? Um, and so I was sitting there, and I was, by this point, the spiritual battle was insane. I mean... It was insane, like, I, to the point where I would wake up in the middle of the night and ask myself, like, how come I don't know who God is? Like, how come I don't have a truth yet? Like, I've studied so hard. I've talked to so many people. I mean, I've snuck out to churches, and I went to mosques, and I just did Jummah prayer after Jummah prayer. And I was like, why don't I know this yet? Like, I went, I talked to atheists, I talked to Buddhists, I talked to Hindus. I mean, I went and, like, picked up every book that I can on all these religions, and I still don't have an answer. And so I was sitting there, and I was, like, looking at my cousin's face, and I was, I was looking at my aunt's faces and my brother's faces, and I was like, I do have an answer. I'm just denying the answer that I know to be true. By this point, I mean... Of course, you know, like, I, it has been revealed to me that Christianity is true. And I'm not just talking about an intellectual journey. While it was a huge intellectual journey, and I had tough theological questions that I had to ask myself, and theological, 
barriers that I had to overcome because there are theological barriers that you have to overcome when you're a Muslim and you already have a preconceived notion of what the Bible is. Um, and so I had to go through, through those things, but it was ultimately the Holy Spirit and His interaction with me that made me see that this is consistent, this is true. Like, this is the God who points out sin. You know, this is the God who calls it out. This is the God who gives answers to questions, real, life-changing answers. And so, I just, I mean, it's ultimately your, your relationship with God's Spirit, and it's ultimately your relationship with God and how you pray. It has, it has I mean, an intellectual journey is important. Finding answers to your questions is important, but ultimately it is God who does the work and who works in your heart. And so I sat there and I was just like, I have nothing more to do. Like, I can't even study more. Like, I've prayed, I've cried my eyes out night after night. I mean, I've, I cried during Ramadan more than like any other month, you know? And I just, I don't want to believe in you. <laughs> Lord, I don't want to believe in you, you know? So I, I look around and I look at my cousin's faces and I look at my family's face and I see my mom's face and I'm just like but none of them will accept me if I'm Christian I mean my brother will probably like beat the crap out of me you know and then my parents will will get angry and lash out at me and then I won't have like this Afghani culture that I love I won't have all this food and all these I won't get to marry an Afghan man and no one will talk to me anymore and so I look at them and I'm like I love them so much that I don't want them to forget about me. I don't want them to to not talk to me anymore. But then I ask myself, well, what is real love? Like, what is true love? True love, I mean, it's wanting the best for the other person. It's completely selfless love. Um, and that's, that's the way marriages work. Marriages are selfless. Um, when God sent Jesus here, it was a selfless act. It was an act for us, you know? Um, and his glory and so I just sat there and I was just like if I truly love them I would accept what is true so that one day they can see it through me and that they might accept it as well there's no guarantee that my family or my cousins or my brothers will accept Jesus Christ um, I had no guarantee at that point but I knew that I could not let them live on into a belief system I could not let it I could not let people believe that I believed in Islam um, I didn't, it just wasn't intellectually satisfying or spiritually satisfying for that matter. Um, and so I just, I knew what I had to do. I had to accept Jesus. I knew what I had to do. And so I went, I went home and I busted out my Quran. Instead of falling on my face and declaring that Jesus is Lord and that he came here and he died for us, instead of declaring the truth of the God of the Bible, instead of declaring him as, as majestic and the creator of this universe, I went home and read my Quran. When I was so convicted, when I was so convicted of what I needed to do, I went home and read my Quran. So I was reading the Quran, I had read like more than I've ever read from the chapters before Medina to the chapters after Medina. I mean, I just read so many surahs that night, more than I've ever read in my entire life. And I sat there and I'm just like, what am I doing? Like, I can't believe I'm reading the Quran right now. It is empty. Like, I was looking for something. I was desperately looking for something in the Quran to say, hey, Nagin, don't convert. <laughs> like, I was looking for something to tell me, like, stop, you know? Like, Allah is Lord. And so, I just... I couldn't find it. There wasn't any substance in those verses. There, there is very little substance in the verses that are in the Quran, especially compared to the to the scripture that's in the Bible. Um, so I push my Quran to the side and I pick up my Bible and I'm like, Jesus, <laughs> like, I no longer believe that you were merely a prophet, but I believe that you are one in the Trinity, that you are one of the persons in the Trinity, and that you were sent here, and that you died for us so that we, we may be reconciled with God. Um, and I just, I said, you know, like, the, the God of the world lies within the Bible. I will deny myself, Lord. I will take up my cross. I will follow you. I know I will be persecuted, but I will follow you. And I said that to myself, like, on my bed. Um, and it was, it just was the, f like, so meaningless. Because, 
when actually living that out, when actually living out the words that I said, when I was trying to deny myself that no matter what the persecution came, I failed and I failed miserably. And I made the cross look minute and just small and, and disgusting because of how badly I, I failed to glorify God and stick to my words of serving Him under the persecution. Um, my first year of being a Christian was really hard. Um, I, I love God. I loved God. I love the gospel. I love the cross. I mean, I love learning more and more about Him and learning more and more about what life is as a steward of Christ. Um, but it wasn't easy, especially with family and persecution and my longing for Islam. It, it just never stopped. I mean, and I wouldn't long for Islam because I was like, I want to worship Allah, you know, I want to go. I mean, the Prophet Muhammad was this great guy. Those weren't the reasons why I longed for Islam. I longed for Islam because the people that I love are Muslim. Because the traditions and cultures that I practice and love are Muslim. That is why I longed for Islam. Not because I thought it was spiritually satisfying. Not because I, I love to be like doing these ridiculous rituals and facing the east when I pray. It wasn't those reasons. It was because God had filled my love, filled my heart with the deep love of all Muslims, of the ones that I know and of the ones that I don't know. Um, and eventually I crumbled. I was like, God, where are you? Like, I'm suffering here. My family is persecuting me. And I miss Islam, like I miss, you know, having the traditions that I used to have. My friends are over there in the mosque, you know, God. Where are my Christian friends? At church? I can't even go to church. My parents don't let me go to church, you know? Um, and so I was just so beat up over this to the point where I was like, I can't do this, Lord. I can't follow you. I wasn't even focused. I wasn't focused on the Lord, and that was my biggest, my biggest fall. Like, I wasn't focused on serving Him. And I wasn't focused on his character and, and learning more about him and being in a relationship with him. I was more focused on my persecution and what I was going through and what I had to lose. That's what I was focused on. And then I was focused on, well, Lord, how can you bless me while I'm going through this? Don't I deserve some blessings? It was such a selfish um, view of a relationship with God, and that's not how it works. So I eventually crumbled under that view, and I had went back to Islam believe it or not, but it wasn't on a basis of believing in this. It wasn't because Allah is gracious and had somehow said, no, you can't be a Christian, like, I will take you out of this. It wasn't for those reasons. I went back to Islam knowing it was false, knowing that it was inconsistent, knowing that historically it doesn't add up, knowing that it doesn't work. <clears throat> and I go back to Islam and I'm just like, I take my Shahada and I'm sitting there and I'm like, holy crap, what did I do right now? Like, I don't believe in this, you know? And so I go and I, the more I'm in the Ummah, the more I'm trying to force myself to be a Muslim, the more I'm trying to just completely change my mindset and forget everything about Christianity because I wanted these things that Christianity couldn't offer me, these petty things like a Muslim wedding. Um, and so I just... But there was a point where I started noticing, like, wow, like, I'm really doing this pretty well. Like, I'm forcing myself to believe in this, and it's working. I'm actually growing a little bit of faith in Islam. I'm starting to look at it and trying to do everything I can to make it look consistent and make the prophet look like a, <laughs> like a morally good prophet. Um, Muhammad, I don't even know. I don't even want to go there. Muhammad wasn't a horrible guy. But he definitely wasn't the best moral example, as Muslims would say. Uh, and so I just did everything that I could to convince myself in Islam. And I was doing pretty well. I started believing it. You know, I started saying, okay, well, you know, let's just forget about everything. I'm going to brainwash myself back to this. And so I... I started, I actually started a blog during that time. And it was for my own comfort. I was so torn inside. And I started a blog, and I wrote on that blog what I was going through, like how I was living this Muslim life, but how much I longed for my relationship with Jesus, how much I miss a Christian God, how much she was convicting me during this time, how much she was hunting me down. I, I started this blog and just wrote about, you know, certain things that, that bothered me during that time. When, when Muslims would say something, I'd be like, does Allah really care about that? Like, does Allah seriously care about something so petty like that? So I'd write on my blog, like, this is what I think. And then I would even use that blog and, and try, to, try to, I was about to shut it down and say, no, no, like, this is bad for me because it's, you know, it's a time of reflection. And when I reflect, I reflect on, 
on how much Islam doesn't make sense to me. Um, but David Wood had actually found that blog, and um, David Wood, you guys all know him from AnsweringMuslims.com, Acts17.net, check it out. Um, so David Wood found that blog, and he started commenting on that blog, and I was like, no way! David Wood just commented on my blog. Like, I watched this guy's debates for hours and used to take notes on his debates with Muslims. Like, dang it! Like, I know that he's going to tell me stuff I don't want to know. And then um, I was speaking to Nabil Qureshi, um, his partner in the ministry, I was speaking to him through email. Um, and he was very patient with me. He didn't lash out and, and get angry at me for going back to Islam or get angry at me for deserting the God of, of the universe. But he's very patient and understood what I was going through and understood why I was feeling the way that I was feeling. Um, and he shared a little bit about his own experience with me and it really encouraged me. And so I was speaking to David through the blog a little bit and he was just, you know, going into things that I didn't want to know. Like, uh, he was definitely putting truth in my face. Um, I, I already knew it, but I, I didn't want someone to confront me with it. You know, especially not someone who I've sat down and watched for hours. <laughs> but, um, and then, uh, so I was just going about my days. I mean, to, at this point I even started wearing the hijab school. I did everything I could. Like, I did everything I could to just be Muslim again. Um, I had gained all these wonderful new friends. And so, David Wood told me to watch a show that him and Sam Shamoon were going to be on called Jesus or Muhammad. And so I'm like, okay, that's really cool. Like I could use I could use that show right now, Jesus or Muhammad. And so um, I skip out on my belief in Allah class and I, I sit down at my computer and I'm watching Jesus or Muhammad um, on abnsat.com. And so I'm like, wow, like I already know these things, but David and Sam were just putting it in my face and putting it in all the viewers' faces. And I was just like, okay, I don't want to listen to this anymore. I know the truth about Islam. You know, I know the truth of who Jesus was. I just, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. So I sat back and I was like, why can't I handle this? Because I'm acknowledging and I'm supporting something that is so wretchedly false. Um, and it, it was then that I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I can't support something that I know is false and, and that is the cause of violence in the world and other atrocities. I couldn't do it. Um, and so there was a couple of weeks passed by and I was, I was at the park and I had my Bible and I was reading First Peter. And um, I had seen a, another couple of episodes of Jesus or Muhammad. So I was reading First Peter, and it was all about being born again to a living hope, um, and our faith being twisted to see the true genuineness of it. And I've just been so convicted of, of the wrong that I've been doing. And I've had like a couple of dreams, you know, that Jesus didn't come down in my dreams, but they were just dreams of, you know, showing me that I did miss miss the God of the Bible. I don't want to get into it because. Um, I don't want to say that those dreams like somehow brought me back to the foot of the cross because they didn't. Um, I never really had a huge dream experience of God saying, Nagin, believe in me now. You know, and I, I used to get angry when other people did because I was like, I didn't have a dream, you know? And so I don't want to get too into those dreams. But um, they definitely, when I woke up, I was definitely reminded of the, the truth of the gospel and the truth of who God is. And so I was sitting there at the park reading First Peter and I was like, <laughs> I can't do this anymore, <laughs> like, I can't do this, like, I love Islam, like, I, I, I love it on a superficial level, if that makes sense, um, but uh, I can't believe in it, like, I miss you, God, like, I miss being in a relationship with the God who is alive, who is active, um, and so, by that point, that night, I had reclaimed, <laughs> it sounds hilarious when I say it, but I had reclaimed my dedication to the God, to the true God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. Um, and my heart just, it hurts, and it's, my heart is broken over what I've done. Um, just how much I've made little of the cross, how much I've shamed the character of His saving grace, because it really is saving grace. I don't want to cry now. But, um, I mean, I made these, these, these Muslims around me believe that that God didn't really save me, that, you know, I just want to be Muslim again, how, how badly I've damaged 
the view of what the cross can do for a Muslim to, to my Muslim friends and it breaks my heart but the only way to make that right is to from here on out you know um, proclaim God through my actions each and every day and each and every day follow him and follow his footsteps and and tell the Muslim world that <laughs> I do believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior uh, and that is the only way to make it right um, and I have to say that even now I still struggle with Islam and I, I just feel this this attachment to Muslims and this attachment to everything that I knew and everything I practiced um, I honestly believe that what I feel is very godly and and very um, there it's just there for a very important reason it is there because I know that my life is to minister to Muslims um, it's to, to share the truth of the character of the Lord who didn't leave me when I left him that is who God is who even through all my crap even through all my bull crap he turned my face toward towards him and I, he doesn't need me he can just use any other vessel that he wants any other person that he wants he doesn't need me but I prayed to him and I asked him during that time I was like if you are true don't let me go and he answered that prayer he heard my prayer and he answered it um, and I just want to say that I've left so many things out, so many different experiences out, so many different things out, so many ways that God has, God's hand has reached down in my life. I've left so much out. I cannot even begin to describe to you how awesome God is, how glorious He is, who, what the character of God really is. And I'm just excited to learn more about Him in the future and be obedient to Him. Because true confession in Jesus Christ isn't about saying that I believe in Jesus, you know, it isn't about words. True confession is about obedience and it's about trusting Him and everything. And I pray that my life can really show that. Um, and I do this for all the Muslims who are watching this, I'm doing this for you and every everyone who's just having questions about God. And, I'm doing this for those who believe in God and who are, you know, have an awesome faith in God. I'm doing this for you as well so that you can see the character of the Lord and just how mighty He is.